Here we go. We got a presentation here, and we're glad to be able to share with you tonight the history of uh, stagecoaches in Santa Barbara County and give you a little stagecoach tour of the West as we travel from a little bit of Southern California up to Santa Barbara and then on to Maddie's Tavern. Um, I've been at the Carriage Museum for 25 years, taking care of the collection there. And now I'm happy to have my son with me uh, to take care of this when I get done with taking care of the museum and, and being there. It's, uh, it's always been a problem over the years, worrying about you know, what's gonna happen to this collection uh, when you retire. So my son, Dylan, uh, Dylan, you wanna share a little bit with us? Hey everybody, thanks for coming and listening to us. Uh, again, my name is Dylan Peterson. I work at the uh, university. I'm an academic coordinator. I run the uh, biology labs. And as you all know, we're online out there as well. And so I've been on the computer for the last eight months trying to do science. And I've also been enjoying the museum, doing a lot of stuff on the side, including this, uh, getting this presentation together. So I hope you all enjoy our Stagecoach Tour of the West. Yeah, we've done this, uh, the, the Stagecoach Tour of the West several times at the museum for the Westerners and several different groups uh, before we had came to the lockdown. Uh, we also started uh, doing a Stagecoach Tour of the West back in 2001, uh, our first, uh, uh, person to do that for us was uh, James Nottage. He was the curator of the Gene Autry Museum and came to Santa Barbara in 2001 and put together a stagecoach tour of the West. Since then, we had Doug Hansen, who is from Lecter, South Dakota, has done some restoration for us. Um, and then John Crockett, who was a curator of the uh, uh, San Inez uh, Carriage Museum up there. So um, we have a little history in this. Uh, hopefully we have some information that you'll enjoy. Behind me is a picture of, uh, of uh, Joel Fithian uh, driving a stagecoach that actually belonged to the, the um, Santa Barbara Historical Museum there, and we have it on loan from them. It was about 1930 in the Fiesta Parade in Santa Barbara. It's uh, interesting to see the people on the roof there. I don't think we could do that today. Uh, and the young fellow wearing a coat and tie riding a bicycle down the street, which is kind of neat. Bill, you want to share your photo there with us? Yeah, I have a picture of the Arlington uh, hotel that uh, was where the current Arlington Theater is. It's a, a 90, uh, 90 room hotel. This picture is approximately 1888, 1889. And the hotel was built by uh, Colonel Hollister, among other uh, investors here in Santa Barbara at the time. Um, uh, one of the bigger names coming out of the uh, hotel at the time was Dixie Thompson, which we'll speak a little bit about later. And he's one of uh, Santa Barbara's uh, key players in the stagecoach days there. Yeah, Dixie Thompson was a, a guy that ran the hotel for Colonel Hollister and Colonel Hollister just told him, he said, give them what they want. And that's what Dixie Thompson did and it became one of the finest hotels in Santa Barbara. Um, there's a long story about a saddle that he owned that was made by Loomis um, Saddle Company here in Santa Barbara that actually sold, um, it was made in 1889. Uh, and sold uh, a couple of years ago at an auction for $190,000. Uh, we didn't have $190,000 to buy it. So obviously we don't have that saddle today, but anyway, yeah, Dixie Thompson was a great guy, ran that hotel and everybody wanted to stay there. So we'll get on to the stagecoach tour of the West here. And, and from for exactly 40 years from 1861 to 1901, stagecoaches traveled uh, the roads of Santa Barbara County uh, through Gaviota and uh, through Lompoc and up to uh, Los Olivos and Los Alamos and then on to San Francisco. Uh, we have a slide. There we go. Uh, this is a Henderson stagecoach. Uh, Henderson is in Stockton, California. And this coach is called the Los Alamos stage and uh, was given to the Carriage Museum by the Luton family. Bill Luton owned um, KUIT and some radio stations in town. His uh, family, Brandy Branquino and um, uh, Bill Luton Jr., who doesn't live in Santa Barbara, was on the board of Old Spanish Days for years and um, Ann Jackson. Uh, anyway, so they this, this stagecoach was used on uh, Ranchero's Vistadores for years and had some restoration work done to it. But when we got it, it needed a full restoration. So we sent it up to Doug Hansen in Lecter, South Dakota. And we put quite a bit of money into it. But you can see today, it's beautiful. It's a 
built in 18, in the state 1850, but Henderson didn't start till 1863, I think it was. So, but it's beautiful. It's on display at the Carriage Museum today. Dylan, you have some? No, no, you covered all that one pretty yeah, good. Just jump uh, in when you when you think of something. Yeah, there. of course. It's yeah. some, uh, some luggage on the top that we had added to the stagecoach, uh, and, and it's in the museum today. So we can go to the next slide. This here's a Saga stage, um, and that's also Anderson, and that was restored by Doug Hansen also. Uh, these coaches were in need of restoration. You know, there's a thing in museums today that um, you want to be careful about, you know, the restoration and preservation that you want to preserve, you know, what you can of the real stagecoach as it was in the day. But, you know, over the years, you figure these were made in around 1860, and, um, you know, a lot of things happened to them. They've been a lot of places. They've done a lot of different things. This stage went down to Saugus, picked up the mail. And you have some information about that, aren't Dylan? Yeah, we'll get to this when, uh, a little yeah. later in the talk when we head around the Rincon corner. Yeah, as they waited for the, the, the tide to go down at the Rincon because the causeway wasn't built until about 1911, I think. Um, but they waited for the, the tide to go down. They beat it around the corner, went to Saugus, picked up the mail and came back. And if uh, they didn't get stuck, then they didn't get robbed. Um, exactly. But, uh, you know, again, another stagecoach that's, uh, you know, on display at the Carriage Museum. What I really like about this stage is we kept the original U.S. mail panel. You can see right above the Santa Barbara de Saugus panel. That's the original paint and the original colors that the, the, uh, the stagecoach originally was. Yeah. The first stagecoach was made in about 1760, and that was actually a covered wagon. And then again in 1901, when the railroads came through, that the stagecoaches died. Um, the uh, picture behind me, that stagecoach that I talked about earlier, that's made by Abbott and Downing. And Abbott and Downing was the premier stagecoach maker. Um, they were called Concord stagecoaches uh, because they were made in Concord, New Hampshire. Um, the one behind me is a mud wagon, like the one that you see on the, the screen right now. And mud wagons were made for outlining areas like Santa Barbara. The roads were rougher. It was cheaper to make them. They were lighter. Uh, and there was a lot of big pluses to have a mud wagon rather than a full stagecoach uh, with the doors and the windows. Um, so in 1903, when the stagecoach, commercial stagecoach travel ended on San Marcos Pass in 1901. And Joel Fithian and this uh, fellow, Mr. Underhill, decided that they were going to give uh, people stagecoach rides up San Marcos Pass. And they had a building built and, and they could change horses when they got to the bottom of the pass and then go up to, up San Marcos Pass. But it was a long travel, even during the commercial days from 1861 to 1901. San Marcos Pass was built in 1868. And so um, it was an eight hour trip from the Arlington Hotel or the, uh, the hotel on Haley and State where they originally started. Um, and it took eight hours to get up there. And you know, today people go, oh, I don't want to go. It's a little far for me to drive. But anyway, this <laughs> is interesting today. Um, there were 130 probably Concord stagecoaches left today in existence. Ken Wheeling of the Carriage Association of America. I had a visit with him. He came out to Santa Barbara and viewed our collection years ago. And he says there's about 130 of them left today. Um, out of all those Concord stagecoaches that Abbott and Downey made. He's, he's, he's seen 129 of them, the other two are, and uh, I think he said 131, but anyway, Here, another slide. Here we have the uh, touring wagon, um, which would uh, you could use to load a bunch of people on and you would tour them around Yosemite or other large parks like that. It was an open top kind of a viewing wagon. You can see here, this one was actually in Santa Barbara for a long time. It was owned by uh, Silsby Spalding, uh, the uh, Tecolote Ranch. And you can see on the left here is a slide of him getting ready to go through Fiesta, probably about 1930 or so. And he has a six up team, a couple guys on the saddles. That's probably him on the right with his parade saddles that we actually have on display at the museum that you guys can come see as well. And this uh, picture on the right is also the same wagon that he used on his ranch in uh, Winchester Canyon. 
you know, in the Tecolote Ranch was, would you say it was a 1,400 acres? Is that right? 1,430, yep. Yeah, 1,430 acres. Yeah, it looks Spanish like an Easter picture of, uh, you can see the ladies all dressed up in white there and they're, yeah, they're yeah. going to Easter church outfit there. But Silsby, they live pretty large out there. He was an oil man and um, his, his ranch went from the back of Winchester Canyon where all those houses are down there today and went all the way to the beach where the Bacara is. Yeah. And uh, he had a house down there right on the beach in those days and they sold the ranch in 1959 and then they developed the property over the years. But the original house is still back there at the back of the canyon. Yeah. This is uh, the, the wagon itself, uh, back to that uh, touring wagon is, uh, is an Avent Downing uh, mountain wagon called a mountain wagon. And that's what they used in, uh, you know, in Yellowstone and the big parks when, before they had the buses. So this is how they got around to see the to tour the uh, Yellowstone and that then. And that again, uh, I don't know if we, did you get that picture today? Uh, yeah, I didn't get it on the slide though. Okay. Yeah, we have a nice, that, that wagon also was uh, restored by Doug Hansen in Lecter, South Dakota again. Uh, it needed some restoration because it was kind of rotten away a little bit on the sides and things. So they did a fantastic job of putting it back together the way that it was. It was new interior and a nice paint job and that too is on display at the at the carriage museum so when you get a chance to go down there after this is this is over here we had to close again because we're we're, we're gone to purple again i guess so anyway we got another slide the, uh, so you want to go with this one go ahead uh this is a, a picture of uh some uh rancheros uh, Vistadores members doing a reenactment uh, crossing the San Ynez River. And this is this the Luton stage coach here that they have? No, that, that's actually, this, uh, it's a Henderson that we have in storage. It's not on display. It's oh, okay. Here, that's the one up in storage. They use it on rancheros, yeah. Gotcha. yeah. So this was probably like 1960s. And uh, it's just a nice example of uh, some guys trying to reenact old, old stagecoach days of the West. Uh, the young man on the horse that's about entering the river there is uh, Jody Young. And he's a, a fairly famous artist. He was a uh, apprentice to Charles Russell. And uh, we have some of his work in our uh, museum as well as the uh, Santa Barbara Historical Museum has many of his uh, actual paintings. I don't know if they're on display, but they do have some and they're beautiful works of art. Yeah, Jody Young, all he wanted to do was be a cowboy all his life. He got meningitis when he was a young man. And uh, so he couldn't hear, but, uh, you know, he became a, a good Western artist as a lot of his work around Santa Barbara. And we have a diorama. It's called, uh, there's uh, a stagecoach and six horses that he made for Selby Spalding in uh, 1932. And we have the original letter from Jody Young that he gave to Selby Spalding uh, when he made the diorama. And it was on display at Tecolote Ranch uh, and then went to their ranch in, uh, in Hope Ranch until 2011 when they donated to the museum. Now it's on display. So this is the first time it's ever been where the public could see this. It took Jody Young 1500 hours to build that stagecoach you see in the, uh, in the diorama. So when you see it, you, it's, it's just unbelievable. It's very nice. He did a great job. Dylan's gonna take us on a stagecoach tour of the West coming up here. So we get the next slide. Um, we had uh, Puel Hauser come to Santa Barbara a few years ago, and I think it still might be on the internet, and uh, kind of did a, a little tour of, of the, uh, the stagecoach days in Santa Barbara. He didn't come to the museum, did a tour of the museum, but they went to the Arlington. We took the Los Olivos stagecoach. We have that actual stagecoach, another Henderson in the collection that hasn't been restored, but it sat in the, uh, in the courthouse up until about 1990, when it came to the museum, they donated the museum because they didn't want the courthouse anymore. Um, but he did that that uh, kind of the driving around. So there, there's 53 signs. And I don't know if you've noticed it through Santa Barbara, all these Santa Barbara people that um, Wells Fargo, these, this group got a grant together from Wells Fargo and had 53 different signs made of all the kind of different stops and places along the way. Uh, all the way, you know, from the Arlen Hotel up to Hollister and then over to Fairview, I think it goes, and then uh, up old San Marcos Pass. Uh, but there's none on San Marcos Pass. Caltrans wouldn't let them put any on there at all. So then until you get to 246 over to Edison where the old college hotel was, 
on the corner of uh, 246 and Edison uh, mm -hmm. is the other one. And then there's few as you go down Edison along to uh, to Maddie's Tavern. So, and those are great. There's little tidbits of information about the whole thing. So if you're driving along, you get a chance to stop and check them out. They're really nice. And the, the group that put that together did a really nice job. They're top quality signs and a lot of great information. Yeah, the uh, map on the left here is the, uh, the route that we'll be taking. Um, we're going to start in Los Angeles and make our way to Los Olivos. Uh, you could buy a ticket from Los Angeles all the way to San Francisco, which is what this red line on the map uh, illuminates. And as I said, we're just going to go all the way up to Los Olivos, which would be about a two to three day journey. Um, and the stagecoach parts were just some reference for, uh, for the viewers to kind of get familiar with uh, parts of the stagecoach. And uh, most of the stagecoaches were made to order where they would actually come in parts and uh, they'd be put together and around the area that you would uh, be using the coach. And you can go to the next slide if you want. Uh, some examples of some stagecoaches, again, that we have in our collection. The one on the right is uh, it's the uh, Abbott Downing stagecoach, is that correct? Yeah, this is a mud wagon that belongs to the historical museum. Yeah, so the type of Western stagecoaches you'd see would be the Concord stagecoach that we talked about. Uh, and the Western mud, mud wagon. Uh, the Yosemite uh, type of wagon was also a Western uh, mountain wagon that was uh, considered a touring wagon. Yeah, and the one on the, on the left there is uh, the Los Olivos coach. It actually went from there on to Los Olivos and it was made by Henderson. It's also a mud wagon too, yep. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, again, just some text to talk a little bit about the, the stage teams and the type of uh, type of teams you would have. And they were often referenced by the uh, number of horses you had, a uh, two up, four up, or six up team pulling the stages, depending on how much uh, uh, cargo you were carrying, how many passengers, the type of wagon, all these were, uh, uh, these would dictate the, how many horses you would have. Um, often you would have uh, stops on these long journeys about 10 to 20 miles apart, depending on the uh, the type of terrain, but most of the time it was right around 15 miles before your horses would need to be either changed or rest, rested and watered. Can we go to the next slide? We'll talk a little bit about the uh, stagecoach drivers. Um, they were known as the Jehu, is that correct? How do you pronounce that? Jihas. Jihus. Yeah, they were they were they they were the stagecoach driver. This particular picture is this selling Carrillo, and that's a, a great story. He was the last stagecoach driver to drive a stagecoach commercially on San Marcos Pass. Again, the state the mud wagon to the right of him is the one that uh, belongs to the historical museum, and I believe that picture was taken because uh, he died in 1957. So that was taken uh, had to been probably in the barn at, uh, at Fifth Inns, because uh, he worked for Joel Fifth Inn. Joel Fifth Inn wanted to teach him how to drive, and he said he didn't want to learn how to drive. He didn't want to drive horses is all he wanted to do. But um, the, um, we have his whip um, that was given to us, and uh, one of his great grandsons called me one day, and he says, you know, he says, uh, you know, I have a whip that belonged to one of the stagecoach drivers. I said, who is that? He says, Selin Creel. I says, oh, yeah. I said, yeah, come on down. So he brought it down, he brought some spurs and stuff. We started walking around the museum and I showed him our bit collection. He said, well, I think it's one of those bits. So he brought us a bit that belonged to the Selen Creole that he actually used, that belonged to, that actually Marduenio made. Marduenio is a famous bit maker here in Santa Barbara County. And uh, it, was, it was quite a piece. Plus the, the whip itself was really nice. It's a, a buckskin uh, lash on it and they're 11 to 12 feet long and then the, the hickory stick on it's uh, uh, about five feet long, but it's the actual whip that he used when he drove a stagecoach back in, uh, you know, the 1800s. A, a funny thing is that when I asked Robert that brought the, the whip to us, I said, you know, I said, uh, how long you had this stuff? He said, well, my great aunt gave it to me in 1989. And I'm going, wow, you know, that could have ended up at a garage sale. But we have it today. And we also have a whip that belonged to Ted Whitney, another famous stagecoach driver. Uh, I believe Selene was one of the last drivers to go over the uh, over San Marcos Pass. If that was correct. Yeah. Okay. So here uh, we'll get into the actual tour of the West here. So um, this is actually a ticket that was issued in 1872 in Los Angeles to get to Santa Barbara on J July 11th. 
and uh, uh, looking up prices around then they would charge you about 10 cents around 10 cents a mile to get uh, from point A to point B and then of course you do the math to figure out how much you'd have to pay uh, it's about would you say about 90 miles 100 miles up from Los Angeles to Santa Barbara so that would cost you probably about 10 bucks or so to go from Los Angeles to Santa Barbara in the stage and around the 19 or the 1880s uh, this is a Flint and Bixby stagecoach line ticket. They were one of the uh, first um, stagecoach companies to actually come up over the uh, over the pass. And uh, uh, Mr. Bixby was uh, uh, essential in construction of San Marcos Pass. And we'll get to him in a little bit. So here we go. Um, so like I said, we're going to start the stagecoach journey in Los Angeles and end in Los Olivos. The journey will take us up the old King Sideway the Old Kings Highway, also known as the El Camino Real. And uh, again, it's highlighted in red here on the left in this picture. Um, this would take a several day journey with many, many stops along the way um, with overnight rests and trading out many horses throughout the journey. Yeah, it was back in, uh, you know, from St. Louis to San Francisco, it was 25 days to make that trip and it was a couple hundred dollars. So mm -hmm. it's a short trip here from LA to San Francisco. How many days was that, do you remember? Uh, from uh, LA to San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't say offhand. I know it's about three days from Santa Barbara or from uh, LA to Los Olivos. Yeah, I would say it's at least a week that you're on yeah. this journey. And here we go. Uh, so this again, uh, just some slides talking about the El Camino Real, the Butterfield Overland Stage Route, which was established in 1858. Uh, was a contract to a guy by the name of uh, James Thompson, and he was contracted by the army to build a, a new road that would uh, bypass Gaviota. So that would come up from Los Angeles to Los Olivos, uh, going through uh, Santa Barbara and San Ynez. And uh, that road was started in 1858 and it was completed in 1862. And the uh, Butterfield Mail Company was the first, uh, first company to use what were called the good roads. Uh, to deliver mail, transport passengers, but many other stage lines used it, like the uh, uh, the Old Coast stage line that was owned by uh, Llewellyn Bixby. And here, uh, uh, this is the uh, Bell Union Hotel, which was the, uh, the first stop, or it's not the first stop, this is where you'd be uh, picked up in the 1870s. Um, this was in LA on Main Street, and like I said, the Bell and Union Hotel. It was owned by the mayor of the town and he sold it in 1856. And then it was, um, a second story was built and it had a very fine dining restaurant. So you could stay the night there, have dinner, wake up in the morning and head on out up to San Francisco if you needed to go that far. But like I said, today, we're just gonna head all the way up to Santa Barbara. And so, uh, yeah. the next slide. So this would be our first stop which is uh, Rancho El Nacino, which is in the San Fernando Valley. So leaving, uh, leaving the, uh, the Bell Union Hotel, this is about 21 miles north of, uh, of Los Angeles. It's a 2,400 acre ranch that was owned by uh, Vincent De La Osa. And it was opened to the public as a way station in 1860s for passing stages. This, like I said, would be the first place you would stop. You wouldn't actually spend the night here as it was only probably about three or four hours outside of LA by stage. Um, you'd stop here to rest, you'd water the horses and just really take a nice rest and get ready for the next four or five hours of journey. Uh, you can see in this slide here, the, um, that street right in front of them is actually Ventura Boulevard, which is still around today. Okay, here um, after leaving the Elencino, your next stop would be um, uh, uh, was through the Caneo Stage Road, and this led up through the San, uh, San Fernando Valley, following the old King's Highway, the old Camino Real, and uh, passing through you know, ranch after ranch. There's just free roaming cattle everywhere because there was no fencing at the time. Barbed wire wasn't invented till 1867, but it wasn't readily available until probably the turn of the century. So you'd have free roaming cattle all throughout these nice pasture lands in the uh, San Fernando Valley. You can see the uh, Mission uh, San Fernando here on the right. Um, our next stop is in Calabasas. Uh, here we have the actual Calabasas post and, uh, and, uh, and store that was um, uh, used by the stage uh, stagecoach passengers and drivers. Here, um, 
Calabasas is a cool little story. They uh, uh, roughly translated in Chumash, it means Valley of the Wild Pumpkin. Um, in 1824, they say a carriage carrying a bunch of pumpkins toppled over. Many of them broke open. Seeds were strewn about. And the next year, there was wild pumpkin patches all around, or known as Lost Calabasas. And uh, it was known also as the place where the pumpkins fell. And actually, this ended up being one of the roughest and toughest stops along the way. Um, there was a dance hall um, and a saloon in the same building. And located next to the uh, saloon was uh, the Calabasas Jail. And behind the jail was a very large oak tree that uh, no uh, prisoner ever wanted to meet. OK, so here's the uh, Stagecoach Inn. The Stagecoach Inn um, is our next stop, and that's in Newberry Park. It was originally the Grand Union Hotel, and it was a first-class establishment which provided uh, fine accommodations, along with fishing, shooting, and uh, most of all, bathing. Uh, the hotel changed many hands throughout the years, and it was even moved once to build the, uh, to build the freeway. And after it was moved uh, to build the freeway, it was renamed the Stagecoach Inn. The building actually still stands today, and it's a local museum. And it's, uh, and it's uh, designated as a California Historical Landmark uh, 659. And uh, this would probably be the first place that they would actually spend the night at uh, on their way up to Santa Barbara. And they'd head out early the following morning. So here's uh, the Camarillo stage stop. And so this, of course, came after Newberry Park. Uh, heading north, you come into Camarillo. And the city, uh, before it was named Camarillo, was called Springfield and had a post office, a church, with just a few other buildings. It wasn't very large at the time until the Camarillo family came in and they uh, bought and owned uh, Rancho Caligas, which uh, stretched from the Conejo grade westward all the way to, uh, to Lewis Road, if you're familiar with the area. Um, you can imagine how large that is. Um, this included part of Camarillo Springs and the Santa Rosa, uh, Santa Rosa Valley. The family, they're farmers and they were integral in bringing uh, Camarillo to life. They, they donated a lot of land to build schools and parks and they also allowed the railroad to pass through their, uh, their property, uh, which actually led to the downfall of Springfield. Um, Adolfo was one of probably the most famous uh, uh, Camarillo fellows. Um, and he was well known for his Camarillo horses that we see in equestrian parades today and here in Santa Barbara in the Fiesta, we've seen them many, many years. Uh, if you wanna speak about the Camarillo horses at all. Yeah, he's still, uh, he still breed, well, he doesn't, but uh, those horses are still around. They still come to the Fiesta Parade from time to time. Uh, Adolfo did ride with the Rancheros Vistadores, and there's lots of pictures around him riding with uh, several of his white horses with him, the Camarillo horses. And so heading north, uh, you'd, you'd uh, soon enter uh, San Buenaventura, as it was called at the time, which is now uh, just Ventura County. And this is where they had to transverse the Rincon Corner. And this was probably one of the most difficult and time consuming uh, stages of the trek north. Um, as we mentioned earlier here, they'd uh, have to use the beach to make their way to Carpinteria. The beach was covered with rocks and the tide was rough. And it, the tide would come all the way up to the cliff. So drivers had to wait until the tide would drop and then they would try to hurry their way past this corner. Um, it was a well-known stop for bandits because you could even sit there for a few hours waiting for the tide to drop and you could be relieved of your jewelry and your money and maybe even the, uh, the Wells Fargo stage, uh, uh, stage safe box. Um, like I said, or like my father mentioned earlier, the uh, Saga stagecoach, which we have was uh, used often and traveled this route in the uh, 1870s. Uh, if you want to mention anything about Cam uh, Rincon Corner. Yeah, that's it. You know, they talk about the stagecoach robberies when we get to uh, when we get to Hobo Rock and Slippery Rock. A lot more information about that there. So after uh, Casitas Pass was developed and opened in about 1878, the Rincon route was largely abandoned uh, to the delight of Wells Fargo, but to the uh, aggregation or the uh, aggravation of, uh, of the bandits. Um, stagecoach drivers um, had a lot easier way coming around the uh, Casitas Pass than they would uh, Rincon Corner. It was a causeway that was built, which was essentially just uh, several piers that were put together over sand and earth. And the trip from Carpinteria came through Summerlin over Ortega Hill and through Montecito, and it ended up around the Bird Refuge 
uh, Cabrillo Boulevard, they would head upstate and then head their way over to the Arlington Hotel. Um, uh, before getting to the Arlington Hotel, they could stop at the Shepherd Inn. Uh, it was a uh, uh, James Shepard, he owned a large ranch in Carpinteria, and when the new route was made, it passed just about 200 feet from his property line. So he took advantage of that new route that, uh, that these uh, stage uh, travelers were traveling, and he would actually uh, cook a pit barbecue, and then it would turn in, and it turned into a fine dining establishment after a little while, and it was a, a destination for wealthy aristocrats at the time. Um, in the early part of the 20th century, there'd be a daily carriage ride from the Arlington or the Potter Hotel that would take you down to the Shepherd's Inn and get you either lunch or dinner. And yeah, the Shepherd's Place is still there today um, and still part of that family that, that actually ran that Shepherd's Inn. There's still some shepherds that live up that way. Yeah, yeah you have uh, big time celebrities like the Roosevelt's and Vanderbilt's would be uh, itching to get some pit barbecue while they're here in Santa Barbara. And so now we're going to kind of start in the Santa Barbara area. We're going to head our way up over the pass here. Uh, we're going to start at the Arlington Hotel. Uh, as I said, this would kind of be the beginning of the journey from Santa Barbara up to Los Olivos through San Ynez. Um, the hotel had become the unofficial center of Santa Barbara around the 1890s, uh, largely because of Colonel Hollister employing Dixie Thompson as the hotel manager at the time. His slogan was, keep your... Uh, keep your customers happy or keep your customers comfortable, your guests comfortable. And that was his, uh, his big um, reason for success was he paid attention to the, uh, to the guests. And people know of Sam Stanwood, who was a county supervisor responsible for quite a few things that have happened in Santa Barbara. And uh, when uh, Sam Stanwood was 14 years old, he worked for Dixie Thompson and uh, had a ranch there up in Alamar and uh, had about 125 horses and was able to supply uh, Dixie Thompson and some of the people that came to Santa Barbara with horses and wagons and uh, things like that to go around town. Yeah, Stanwood uh, was the uh, El Presidente for, was it 40 years, I believe, for Fiesta? Yes. And um, he also was, you know, he was around at the turn of the century, so he saw automobiles come into play around the city and, you know, him being a a horse rider and a trail man, he realized that the trails could actually be turned into roads. And he was uh, one of our county uh, supervisors that suggested to start building roads here in town. And so he's largely responsible for, for a lot of uh, what we have here in town today. We actually have one of his saddles also at the, uh, at the museum that you guys can come down. And take yeah, it belongs to the historical museum uh, and we have it on loan. Uh, and it's the Visalia saddle, very nice. Beautifully engraved, has his initials carved in the cantle in the back. It's a really nice saddle. So next here uh, is another picture of the Arlington Hotel with a stagecoach ready to take off in the morning. Um, as we said, uh, Dixie was the main proprietor of the hotel in the 1880s, and you know he would make sure the guests were comfortable. As we said, he'd set these stagecoaches up and get them ready for the uh, travelers. After they spend the night, about 8 a.m., they'd come out front. There'd be a stagecoach waiting for them. They'd all jump on board and head on their way up to Los Olivos to eventually to Maddie's Tavern. Um, this slide is uh, the one we have behind Tom here. And this is also a, uh... no, you're right. Go for it. Next slide. Yeah, this is a Joel Fithian to Abbott and Downing stagecoach that uh, was used in Fiesta. We just wanted to show this slide because, you know, as we said, Santa Barbara, uh, State Street and the Arlington Hotel was really a main focus of the town, maybe even the town center, if you say. And, you know, this being State Street, this is a, a fiesta parade in the 1930s uh, with, as I said, uh, Joel Fithian's Abbott Downing stagecoach there. So here, uh, the San Marcos shortcut, or it was called at the time the San Ynez Turnpike Road. Uh, it was financed by several wealthy Santa Barbara men. Um, so uh, over San Marcos Pass, they crested 2,200 feet, and the uh, individuals that were in kind of the, uh, the brainchild for making this uh, road were uh, Samuel Brinkerhoff, uh, Brinkerhoff Road here in town. Um, he recruited a, a banker, Charles Fernald, landowners as Colonel Hollister and the Dibley brothers, uh, Charles, uh, Judge Charles Hughes, Edwin Olive Wells Fargo, and Lou L. Bixby of the stage, uh, the Coastline Stage Company. 
Uh, they originally built San Marcos Pass as a toll road. They thought this would be able to pay off their investment using it as a toll road. Uh, you'd save several hours by bypassing Gaviota and coming over the, uh, over the, uh, over the pass. Uh, the toll road was to be run by a fellow by the name of Patrick Kennevin, which you may or may not uh, notice, uh, Kennevin Road at the uh, crest of San Marcos Pass. And we're going to speak about him here in a, little, in a few moments. So the stagecoaches, they leave the Arlington, head up State Street, and then take a, take a right on Turnpike Road, head up to Foothill, and then head up uh, old San Marcos Pass. Um, here we just have some old vintage pictures of San Marcos Pass, um, people actually traveling on there on their way up. One of the first notable features that you would uh, pass through on the way up Old San Marcos Pass was a Slippery Rock, uh, known to the locals as Slippery Sal. Um, it's a feature that's still still around today. I think it's on private land, so the public can't just go check it out. But it was uh, these ruts and uh, grooves that were carved in the uh, in the stone by uh, Chinese laborers. Uh, the laborers were there to build the pass, and they felt that this was an easy way to help horses up the up the grade here. So they would, you know, carve these grooves for the horses that would allow them to get a better purchase on the ground there. And you can see also um, in the picture on the left, you can see actually there's two sets of, uh, of, of grooves. Uh, one, the first original one began getting too deep and would start to damage the hubs of the, of the stagecoaches. So they shifted to the right there a little bit and uh, were able to uh, make new ruts. Do you want to say anything about uh, Slippery Rock? Yeah, that well, Slippery Rock and Ho Hobo Rock. Hobo Rock was where they had most of the stage robberies there. And, um, you know, during those days, they um, a lot of people think that they uh, they robbed a stagecoach most of the time. And not so much Santa Barbara County, but stagecoaches in general was they were robbing them for the strong box that sat underneath the, the driver uh, who was carrying. And they thought, thought all the loot might be in there. But they were actually robbed because of the salesmen that used to travel by stagecoach. Uh, the reason why they call them stagecoaches is because they went from, you know, from one stage to another stage to another stage. Um, stage commercial stagecoaches were painted red, uh, red and yellow. So when you saw a stagecoach coming with red and yellow, then you knew that it was a commercial coach and they were waiting for the coach to come. But they were robbed mo mostly because the salesman dealt in cash. So he went to the general store, picked up the cash from the last order, took the new order, and um, so he had all that cash on him, and that's why the stagecoaches were robbed for the salesmen that were on there. Most of the time, they robbed them for the strong box too, but that was part of the reason. So here, uh, as you mentioned just a few moments ago, is uh, Hobo Rock. Uh, yeah. This was one of the first resting stops on the way up the pass. It was a nice shady area with some flat ground. And yeah. it's a 40, 40 it uh, there anymore today. <clears throat> Yeah, it's a 40 foot cube of a shale rock that was dislodged millennia ago, tumbled down uh, San Jose Creek and came to its resting spot, which is where current uh, Hidden Valley Ranch is. Um, like I said, it was a comfortable spot to rest and also a comfortable spot for bandits to hang out and wait for the uh, salesman to come by. They'd hide in the brush and then, you know, attempt to rob the, uh, the coach there. The rock was actually demolished in 1963 to build the current. Uh, the current San Marcos Pass there. And you can see this is a nice, beautiful picture of, of Hobo Rock with a little stagecoach resting there in the lower left of the rock. That's uh, just a nice little picture of, uh, again, uh, some area between uh, Slippery Rock and Kennevin Road. <clears throat> uh, you Transversing the pass, you would uh, Come to several flat areas, and it was hard on the horses, you know, coming up here. So they would often, you know, kick some of the guys off the stage and make, make them walk right next to it to, to alleviate some uh, some stress on the horses. And this would be one of those places that that would happen. Yeah, they were sitting. The the stages were built on, uh, and the mud wagons were built on thorough braces. Thorough braces are strips of leather, so the 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 stage body of the stage kind of sat in this little bucket effect. I think Mark Twain had mentioned one time that it was like riding in a bathtub because it rocks so much, you know, but <laughs> it was sitting there making the ride a lot smoother than it would have been sitting on springs. Right. You can head to the next slide. That, uh, yeah, the slippery rock, that's still there today. That's uh, 
goes from the, uh, you can get to it from the top of, uh, well, you can't get to it, it's on private property today, but uh, there was a place called Windermere Ranch that had it years ago and I was able to see that about 15 years ago. I actually got to see it, but. Yeah, I've yet to make my way up there. So here we got uh, uh, Pat and Nora Kennevin um, at the summit of San Marcos Pass, which is about 2,200 feet up. We have uh, Kennevin Summit Station, which was run by Pat and Nora. Pat was uh, born in Ireland in 1834, and to escape uh, the life of a coal miner, he came to America, settled in Texas as a cowboy, driving Longhorn cattle. Uh, he then joined the Union and fought in the Civil War as a cavalry lieutenant under uh, General uh, George Meade. Uh, after the war, he moved to California and was employed by the Flint Bixby Stage Company. Uh, him and his wife uh, ran the summit station. They collected the tolls and uh, attended stock horses for the stagecoaches to uh, exchange out. That's why it's Kennevin Road up there at the top of the pass today, too. I've probably seen that driving up there. Oh, yeah. Um, here we have some pictures of the Kennevin House. Uh, it was well known as a great place to grab an afternoon meal change out your horses from the Arlington. They would arrive around noon, so about four hours after departure. Uh, Nora prepared all the food and uh, she never charged for any meals, but she left an oak bucket out in front of the door and guests would, uh, would leave a free will offering, was, was what it was called. So she actually never asked for any money from anybody, but that paid off quite handsomely. And over the 30 years that she supplied travelers with food and, and beverage uh, there from their ranch and the orchard, she was actually never never taken advantage of. She was never robbed or swindled or anything like that. And that probably is because she made one of the best peach pies out in uh, California. <laughs> and so after uh, your rest at Kennevin, you'd have a nice meal. You'd start heading down the north side of the pass. And uh, your first stop again would be uh, to rest the horses at uh, Cold Spring. It was originally a crisp, cool spring that flowed uh, crystal clear out of the mountainside and it was sluiced down into hollowed out logs so the horses could drink. Uh, again, it was about halfway down the north side of the pass and it was a shady, pleasant place to, uh, to stop and have a, have a rest. As you can see, these uh, four individuals here sitting on the side of the spring here, um, they kind of reflect probably what it felt like riding on one of these wagons for days at an end. Probably had about 12 cents in their pocket and uh, just happy to stay warm. So the romanticism of the stagecoach days is probably a little, uh, little, uh, a little blown out of proportion. Yeah, it was a you know they say a romantic time to live in those days, but people don't realize how tough life was. And uh, the driver of the stagecoach here was Ted Whitney's father. Ted Whitney drove stagecoaches. Uh, on San Marcos Pass also, and this is his father driving this stagecoach here. So like, uh, this is a Cold Spring Tavern as it is today. Uh, it was built, first built uh, to house uh, Chinese workers that would help build San Marcos Pass at the time. And it was abandoned after the pass was completed until about 1870, when of all things, a Frenchman moved in and he opened up a ballet school and tried to have students come up to trek to San Marcos Pass to learn ballet. But by the time they got to the school, they were just too tuckered out to even, even try. So the school failed pretty rapidly. Uh, after it was closed, there was a, a, a short time restaurant that opened that was called the Hermitage. Um, the owner was arrested for murdering his wife. The, the restaurant then closed until it was moved. And then a few decades later, uh, reopened as the, in the current location it is today as the uh, Cold Spring Tavern. Um, it's a popular gathering spot, uh, especially on Sundays. You get a lot of bikers that come by and they make award-winning tri-tip sandwiches that's actually been featured on the Food Network. So uh, after leaving, uh, leaving uh, Cold Spring Tavern, you uh, head down the rest of the mountainside until you got to San Inez River. And you cross the river into the sleepy little town of San Inez, which was founded in 1888. The town had a minor bloom in the 18, uh, late 1800s um, with the assumption that the railroad line was going to be built through there. Uh, that never happened. So the town kind of remains a small but popular town today. Yeah, this picture on the right is the, the follow-up picture of uh, that river crossing we just saw earlier with Jody Young in there. And the, picture of the stagecoach that belonged to the 
uh, it belongs to the Carriage Museum, but this again is a, a ranchero's ride and they're crossing the river here going up to their next stop. Uh, here's a small little picture of uh, San Inez back in the uh, in the early days before it actually became anything significant. You can see uh, it almost looks like a little town out of, uh, out of the third episode of Back to the Future, <laughs> a classic Western town. We have a bunch of stagecoaches here and you can see the amount of people piled on top of that one stage there. I don't know if that would be very safe to do nowadays, but uh, they give it a try back then, that's for sure. Okay, here we have a, a college hotel in San Ynez. Um, the town, like I said, was pretty small. It had a post office, a general store, uh, but the college hotel was erected in 1889. This is a beautiful looking hotel. It cost about $30,000 to build back in the uh, late 1880s. Um, it became a stagecoach a stagecoach stop twice daily, once leaving San Ynez and once arriving. Uh, it's just a magnificent looking building for the time. So coming up to the end of the stagecoach tour here from San Ynez, our next stop, final stop was going to be a, a, at Maddie's Tavern in Los Olivos. Uh, Maddie's Tavern was run by Felix Maddie. He was born in 1853 in Switzerland and came to San Francisco at the age of 15. Uh, him and his family then traveled down the coast and ended up settling in Los Olivos. They purchased a small home in 1886, which would end up being next to the terminus of the railroad. Uh, you saw potential and set up shop. They built a seven room hotel and a restaurant and it became very successful. Uh, the other hotel in the area was actually burned down right after he built his hotel and he had a virtual monopoly and his business just flourished. Uh, many people made the uh, trek to Los Olivos via rail and stagecoach throughout the years. Uh, there was legendary bird hunting in the area. And uh, looking at the registrar of the hotel, it's filled with plenty of famous names, Pillsbury's, Vanderbilt's, and even Susan B. Anthony stayed at Maddie's Tavern. Um, apparently she was kind of a pill, is what I've been told. Uh, Los Olivos continued to prosper and eventually replaced the Gaviota Wharf as the shipping hub for the area. Uh, stages stopped running the pass in 1901, ending the romantic but not so comfortable days of the stagecoach travel. And that sums it up for our stagecoach tour of the West. We've headed all the way up from LA to uh, Los Olivos, probably would you say about 120 miles or so over a period of about three yeah. days. Yeah, for and, sure. And, yeah. Um, and probably a lot of a lot of sore sore rear ends after that. Yeah, they had a a, a list of uh, travel tips for passengers when you're riding on a stagecoach, and and they've been published around in different uh, Walker Tompkins book. Uh, that uh, available at the library. Uh, Stagecoach Days in Santa Barbara has a lot of interesting information if you're interested in, it's a paperback book, but it's it's got a lot of good information about Santa Barbara County and Stagecoach Days. And, and then Walker Tompkins, I don't know how many books that he wrote, but he wrote quite a bit about Santa Barbara. And uh, he donated all that stuff to the, uh, to the library at UCSB. So Dylan was able to go over and get a lot of things that we have. We have a, um, a display, an exhibit of, of sorts at the museum today called a Stagecoach Tour of the West. It has a lot of the pictures that you see here today and more. And then of course you can see all the stagecoaches that we've restored that we have on display. That mountain wagon that was in that last picture there is, we're pretty, pretty much know that that probably belonged to the one that Selby Spalding bought, not for sure. Uh, but uh, some of the travel tips they have that abstinent from liquor, uh, from liquor is preferred, but uh, if you have a bottle, pass it around and don't forget the driver. Um, you know, they talk about, uh, you know, not to sleep on your neighbors because it's rude. Um, but anyway, then those that's published also in that book too. But yeah, there's a lot more information on stagecoaches, but we wanted to give you a little tour that, that we put together. And I think it's uh, some great information. There's some, uh, if you have some questions, I think Michael's monitoring those questions there, and we'd sure like to hear from you if you have some questions. And uh, don't forget to come down and visit the museum. We're all, also grateful to the Santa Barbara Historical Museum. We have probably six or eight saddles, maybe nine, uh, that we've been able to borrow from the museum. Uh, some uh, belong to Dwight Murphy and some other prominent people in Santa Barbara. So 
we have a great relationship with them and, and we're happy to be able to do our little stagecoach tour of the West on your Zoom calendar. And we appreciate that. 